The baby's birth would both divide and unite, and Simeon knew it. Holding Christ in his arms, he beheld the face of God. Today is New Year's Eve. As we measure time, another year is dawning. We need to realize, as Simeon did, that the coming of Christ is the pivotal event of all time. And we must make a choice what to do with Jesus. Stay with us. From the Moody Church in Chicago, this is Running to Win with Dr. Erwin Lutzer, whose clear teaching helps us make it across the finish line. On this special Christmas edition of Running to Win, Dr. Lutzer concludes his message, A Man Who Cradled God in His Arms. In Simeon's eyes, this child would first be a stone and then a sign. You have the sign that many people would oppose despite the miraculous nature of Jesus Christ and his resurrection, which is the last sign he said he would give to the world. And then, of course, you also have the sword, which was particularly directed toward Mary that would enter into her own soul. What I'd like to do to make sure that you get your money's worth today is to conclude with three very important lessons that will tie together the strands that we have uncovered in the life of Simeon. Three very important lessons, and you can take them down, and when you write them down, they are yours absolutely free. We're being generous today. Number one, those who look for Christ's appearing can see more than those who don't. Those who look for Christ's appearing can see more than those who don't. Simeon, bless his heart, was looking for the consolation of Israel. And God graciously and wondrously said, Simeon, you are looking for it, you shall see it, and you shall hold the consolation of Israel in your very arms. And just as Simeon and so few people in that day were looking to the birth of the Messiah, there were a few, Anna, whom we will not comment on, but whose story follows this text, was another one like that. There were just these few people who still believed. The masses said, you're crazy. We've been waiting for centuries for the Lord to come, and he hasn't come. What makes you think he might come in our generation? But Simeon, bless his heart, said, I've got a promise to hang on to. And I don't know for sure that I'll be alive when I see the Lord's Christ, but oh, how I would like to be here when he comes. The very same way the Apostle Paul says that there is a crown of righteousness awaiting for those who love the Lord's appearing. And the Apostle Paul encourages us to love the Lord's appearing, to look for His appearing. For unto them who look for Him, the Bible says, He shall appear a second time without sin unto salvation. So I need to ask you, as we will soon be beginning a new year, do you pray and say, Oh Lord, I'd love to be among the generation of those who see the sign of the Son of Man and those who are alive at His appearing. Because the Bible says that someday there's going to be a whole generation of Christians that will not have to taste death, but they will be taken away in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye at the last trump. The trumpets shall sound and the Lord shall return. Those who look for the coming of Christ see more than those who don't. And whether we live during that period of time or not, that should be the consuming desire of every one of us, even so come Lord Jesus, because we love Him so much, we would love to see Him so soon. And when you wait for Him, you get to see more than when you don't. There's lesson number two. And that is that in this life, in this life, blessings sometimes have burdens connected with them. Uh, you have a blessing that comes to you, and concealed in that blessing, there is a burden that you did not expect. 
We're told through Jewish literature that every Jewish maiden wished and hoped and prayed that she would be the one chosen by God to bear the Messiah. Based on Isaiah's prediction, there were those women who thought to themselves, wouldn't it be something if I would be chosen? And Mary herself said, all generations shall call me blessed. What, a, what an honor to be involved in that piece of God's miraculous program. And so when Mary had the angel come to her and when she knew that she would conceive by the Holy Spirit, no wonder she broke out in a song of joy. But oh, little did she know that along with that blessing there would be a burden. Along with that honor there would be a horror because the sword would pierce her heart. And even though she would be blessed... She would also have the experience of great pain and great anguish and her life would not be easy though she was right in the middle of the will of God a part and an important part of his program. As I was thinking about that this morning I thought to myself you know the reverse is also true. If it is true that with blessings oftentimes there are burdens that are concealed the reverse is also correct that along with burdens that come to you, there may be blessings that are concealed. You know, whenever we have a burden, we always say, God, lift it, take it, do something with it, rid me of it, get me through this. And what we don't understand is that God might be willing to lead us through it rather than to take it away because in the midst of pain, there is also privilege. And God says, I'm going to use this experience in your life to draw you closer to me and in the midst of that heavy burden that I have given you, there is going to be concealed a wondrous blessing that will grow in your life to your benefit. So that's the second lesson. That burdens and blessings come together. And the third lesson is that all who hear about Christ all who hear about Christ are affected by him. They're affected by him. You'll notice that everyone that confronted Jesus Christ in the New Testament either embraced him 